today the topic is going to be uh, the stability of zero. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Well, uh, the ultimate goal of this uh, series of lectures is, is to study the stability of solitons. Uh, but before getting there, we should, you know, first uh, deal with an easier case, which is the stability of the zero solution. Uh, so the, the model problem that we will follow is uh, a nonlinear Schrodinger equation with a pure power uh, nonlinearity. And we'll, e we'll even uh, only consider two cases, the cubic alpha equals 3 and the quintic alpha equals 5. Uh, so that's, that's the evolution problem. And uh, we prescribe data u0, uh, which we assume to be small. Uh, it's, it's an interesting question to deal with uh, large data. But uh, you know, for this class, we'll be happy with uh, small data. We want to, to see that uh, the corresponding solution of uh, NLS goes to zero locally. So the question, so we want, the, the aim is to show, prove that U goes to zero locally. Excuse me? Yes. I have a short question on the alpha. Um, so you said we're looking at the cubic or the quintic NLS. Ah, that's a very good point. Yes, thank you. So let's say it's alpha minus one. Thank you. Um, right, so we want to show that locally the solution goes to zero. Um, and of course, that's, that's a warm up for the harder case of, of solitons, where uh, the solution is not expected to go to zero locally, but it's supposed to go locally towards, to converge locally towards the, the soliton. Yes, so, 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 so that's our aim. Uh, maybe a slightly more ambitious aim is to characterize the large time behavior of U. So basically the idea for all such problems is, is to, uh, to see that, you, you see the, the nonlinearity is a higher order than the, non, than the linear part of the equation. So for instance, let's say it's, it's cubic. It means that if U becomes small, the cubic part is going to be much smaller than the linear part of the, of the equation. And so what you expect is that uh, expectation u looks like a linear solution. And a linear solution, we will denote them e, i, t, Laplacian, f. Uh, and this is as t goes to infinity. Right, uh, so, so we'll see that uh, linear waves decay. So if this is true, and of course it has to be made more precise, if this is true, then u goes to zero locally, but this is a stronger statement than just u going to zero locally. Um, okay, so that's, that's our aim for, for today. Uh, before uh, getting into uh, estimates, I would like to um, maybe discuss uh, what mechanisms are, are responsible for the uh, stability of zero. What are mechanisms that uh, uh, yield uh, stability or, of course, conversely, instability? Uh, let me erase. But perhaps you have any, any questions before I go further? So this expectation means that um, the solution is asymptotically close to the linear, to the solution to the linear uh, Schrodinger equation, right? 
That's right. Yes. So you, you, I, I hope you can still read. Uh, so what, what, so this is somewhat vague, right? This, this, this twiddle, it means that in some, some norm, in some topology, U looks like a linear solution for some F, right? That's, that's what I mean here. Thank you. Sorry, can you can you repeat your question? Uh, we just talked about that the solution looks like the solution for the linear Schrodinger equation. Yes. But it does it uh, only look like uh, the um, solution for the free Schrodinger equation? Because I think a general linear equ a Schrodinger equation can look a bit different. So which? Uh, so to me, free. Uh, and linear means the same, but what, what difference do you make? Um, when, when you have like an extra term or something. I mean a potential. Uh, yeah, but not dependent on you. Well, right, a, a fixed potential. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I said the linear, but I, I meant linear with zero potential, right? So oh, okay, yeah. otherwise I would have denoted it uh, minus Laplacian plus V, right? But here it's just the Laplacian, so really no potential. Okay, thank you. Okay, so... Ouch. Right, so what are the mechanisms for uh, stability or instability? Mechanisms. Okay, this doesn't... It's just, uh, I think there are some people uh, still in the waiting room. Ah, yes. Thanks for letting me know. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the mechanisms. First mechanism is obviously uh, decay. Right, so we'll come back to that shortly. So it's, it's the fact that, uh, you know, the linear solution, so this guy, so that, that's the solution of the linear Schrodinger equation with uh, zero potential. This guy goes to zero uh, pointwise or locally. Why is it a mechanism for stability? Because, uh, as I was saying, when this happens, the nonlinear term becomes negligible compared to the linear term. And, and so all that remains is the, is the, is the linear solution. So that's uh, the first mechanism. Uh, the second important point is uh, the idea of, of resonance. So resonance can mean uh, many things in mathematics. So here I, 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 I mean resonance in the sense of uh, uh, dynamical systems. Uh, so maybe the, the, the simplest a uh, way to understand that is to look at a, at a toy model. Uh, so it, it's a, so le let's look at a toy model. That's just a, a dynamical system in R2. So uh, U is just a, 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 an oscillator at frequency alpha. And then a V is also an oscillator, so dot means uh, derivative with respect to time. V is also an oscillator with frequency 2, and then it's forced by U. Okay, so that's uh, you know, the, the simplest model where you can, we can see the, the phenomenon of a, of a resonance. And it's so simple that you can solve uh, explicitly, right? 
So I did the computation. So, you know, it's not hard. First you solve for u, and then you plug it in and you solve for v. Uh, so what you find is that uh, if alpha is not, um, if alpha is not one, then you get uh, the following formula, v equals v naught e to the minus two i t plus u naught squared or minus sorry minus u naught squared e to the minus two i alpha t minus e to the minus two i t divided by two minus two alpha. Uh, okay, and there is a formula for u which is even simpler, and v naught and u naught are the initial data for uh, u and v. So you see, if alpha is not one, then uh, this just uh, keeps on oscillating at, at you know certain frequencies and with amplitudes that depend on the data. Now, if alpha equals one, you see that the uh, denominator degenerates, and what you find is linear growth. Namely, v is uh, v naught e to the minus two i t minus i e to the minus two i t times t times u naught squared. So the important point is that there is a t here. So uh, if alpha is one, you get a linear growth, which is uh, also sometimes called secular growth, and then the system becomes unstable in an obvious sense, right? No matter how small you take the data, the solution can become arbitrarily large. So that's you know, a well-known phenomenon, basically. Uh, the equation on v is forced by u, and if u squared uh, happens to force this equation at a frequency which is the uh, eigenfrequency of, of v, well, then uh, you, get, you get linear growth. Uh, so what, what would it mean in the context of a nonlinear dispersive equation? Uh, you see what matters is uh, the uh, eigenvalues of the um, linearized problem, right? Basically, if you, if you forget about u squared and, and you look at the linearized problem, you compute its eigenvalues, and then you see how through the nonlinearity uh, these eigenvalues uh, interact. So that's something that we're, we're going to have to do for uh, uh, nonlinear dispersive problems. Okay, and, and of course, it, it goes together with decay because for uh, nonlinear dispersive equations, waves always decay, but if on top of it they have a resonant interaction, then there might be um, a problem, as, as we'll see. Okay, so that's two important elements. And there is a third one. Um, before I erase, maybe you have questions. Okay, so let me erase. Uh, so a third uh, important mechanism is the uh, localization of waves. So this is something which is uh, specific to uh, dispersive problems. So dispersive problems have the characteristic that uh, different frequencies propagate at different velocities in, in space-time. So uh, maybe let's just review uh, a small proof of, of this fact. Uh, so um, right. So let, let's let's assume that u naught 
is localized in physical space around zero and in Fourier space around some uh, xi naught. So a formula that we'll use all the time, so maybe let me do the small computation, how to solve uh, the linear Schrodinger equation with zero potential. So you start from this, you take the Fourier transform, so the Laplacian becomes plus xi squared, xi is the Fourier variable. Now you can uh, solve for this, this means that u hat of t xi is e to the uh, i t x e squared u naught hat. And then you take the inverse Fourier transform, so you obtain that u of t x, I'm, I'm dropping uh, you know, some constants, this is the integral of e i t x e squared minus x x e u naught hat of x e d x e. So that's, that's just the, the formula. Now let's try to exploit this formula to understand where this wave is going to be localized if u naught is localized in physical space around zero and in Fourier space around xi naught. Uh, so the idea is to use the stationary phase lemma. Uh, maybe let me recall it here. So stationary phase lemma. If you look at an integral of this type. So it's an oscillatory integral and you want to compute its behavior for large time. Well, uh, once again, I drop constants. This is equivalent to one over square root of lambda. So phi is a phase function and f is just a nice localized function. So this is equivalent to uh, 1 over square root of lambda phi double prime of x naught e to the i lambda phi of x naught f of x naught where x naught is, uh, let's say it's the unique critical point of phi. So it's the unique point where phi prime of x naught is zero. Right, so that's a, a very important result. Now let's apply it to uh, our solution here. So u, this is, it looks like that. Well, we'd like this guy to look a bit more like the stationary phase problem. And we're interested in, in, in the large time behavior. So we're gonna have factor t out. So this is the integral of e i t xi squared minus capital X xi u naught hat of xi dx where x is uh, little x divided by t. So now this looks exactly like the stationary phase uh, you know, formula. t plays the role of lambda and this phase function c squared minus x c is, is phi of x. So now it's a, just a small computation. You compute the stationary point of, of this phase and you apply this formula and uh, so I did the computation. What comes out is one over square root of t. There is an oscillatory factor that I don't record. There is a constant that I don't record. And then there is u naught hat of x over two t. So that's a very important formula. So uh, w w what do we learn from here? So we learn that there is decay uh, as appears in this factor, one over square root of t. And also if u naught hat is localized in Fourier close to xi naught, it means that x over two t has to be close to xi naught. So in other words, it means that if I, if I draw a picture in space time, so this is uh, x and this is t. Here there is like a line which is x over 2t equals xi naught. And so my wave is going to be localized 
here. Right. So this, this is a nice formula. So it captures both the decay of waves and their space-time localization property. And you see, this space-time localization uh, depends on the Fourier localization of the data, and that's a characteristic of, of dispersive waves. Um, right, so how is it going to impact the stability problems? Uh, well, you remember that we just discussed resonances, and resonances was about the interaction of, of different frequencies through the nonlinear term, right? Now, what, what, we, what we see here is that, you know, if I look at different frequencies, a priori, they're not going to live in the same region of space-time. And if this happens, even if they're resonant, then they're not going to be able to uh, contribute much to the, to the problem. So, so that's, that's an important uh, element. So we'll use all of this uh, somewhat uh, implicitly, but I think these are really the three important elements. So decay, resonance, and, and localization of, of waves. Uh, do you guys have questions? Okay, so this was a somewhat heuristic discussion. Now uh, let's prove estimates. So first we're going to uh, you know, review and prove very quickly the classical uh, estimates, uh, which are called the dispersive estimates and the strikeout estimates. They are just about decay. They, 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 they give you decay of waves. Uh, we're going to use them to uh, prove some uh, stability of zero results. And then at the end of the class, we'll, we'll get to this uh, resonance question. Oh yeah, so t thanks for telling me. I, I'm, I'm not sure what happened. Um, okay, so dispersive estimates. So if uh, the exponent p lies between 2 and infinity, then the linear solution with the initial data f of the Schrodinger equation, so this is in Lp, is less than uh, t or 1 over t, 1 over t to the 1 half minus 1 over p times the norm of f in Lp prime. So this funny uh, less than or equal sign means up to a constant that I leave implicit. So that's just one. And P prime is the dual exponent to, pre, to P. Uh, so, so the proof is, uh, is very simple. Uh, let, let's, let's go through it. So once again, what this is expressing Maybe I, sh I should say that first. This is expressing decay if your um, data has uh, some integrability properties. So you get the best decay, so the largest power, if p equals infinite, so point-wise, you get a decay of 1 over t to the 1 half. And if p is 2, which is the other extreme, 
you get uh, nothing, well, that's not surprising because the L2 norm is conserved. Uh, so now let's let's prove this theorem. Uh, so the proof proceeds by interpolation between the the endpoints uh, between p equals two and p equals infinity. So in other words, it suffices to prove the endpoints, and then uh, you you apply your favorite uh, interpolation estimate. Or interpolation theorem. So p equals two is just the conservation of the L two ma L two norm, uh, which in physical terms is the you know conservation of the density of probability. Uh, so let's 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 see how this works. So it's basically just uh, playing with the definition and using Planchuel's theorem. So this by Planchuel is Sorry, by definition, this uh, is a certain formula in Fourier, and by Planchuel's theorem, the norm in physical space in L2 and the norm in Fourier in L2 agree. Now, this complex exponential has, has norm 1, has modulus 1, so we might just uh, drop it. And then you use once again uh, Planchuel. So the L2 norm is conserved. How about uh, p equals infinity? So for p equals infinity, we want to uh, estimate the L infinity norm of this guy. So uh, by um, definition, this is the inverse Fourier transform, which I denote by uh, F inverse, of e to the minus i t x e squared times f hat of xi in L2. Now we know that the Fourier transform or the inverse Fourier transform, they exchange uh, product and convolution. So this is uh, the same thing as the Fourier transform or inverse Fourier transform, it doesn't matter, e minus i t x e squared uh, times f hat of xi. Sorry. This convolved with, uh, let me erase. Convolved with f, and this is in an infinity. All right. So now we use that l one convolved with l infinity gets you to l infinity, which is immediate just by writing the definition. So then this is less than uh, the norm of f in l one times the norm of e to the minus i t x e squared, uh, inverse Fourier transform, in L infinity. Right. So now, uh, you know, at this point, we're, we're discussing the, the Fourier transform of a function which is uh, just bounded, which is not decaying. So there are two possibilities. Either you understand this in the sense of distributions, or you regularize uh, by, for instance, adding, uh, looking at e to the minus i t c squared minus epsilon c squared, with, where you let epsilon go to infinity, uh, to make sense of, of all this. So, so now all that there remains is that we want to show that this guy here is less than uh, 1 over square root of t. Right? This is what we need to uh, match the estimate we have here. Uh, 
So now, if there was not an I, this would just be the Fourier transform of a Gaussian with um, with uh, this this factor t, and we know the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian, and and we would get the result. Uh, now there is an I, so uh, it's a you know it's like we're looking at a complex Gaussian instead of a regular Gaussian, but it's it's a small exercise to show that. Uh, the Fourier transform of E i x e squared is E i x squared. So, so I, I, I use a bit uh, interchangeably the Fourier transform of the and the inverse Fourier transform because the formulas are very close. Um, and this is true uh, up to uh, constants and, and signs which I drop. And, and to prove that, uh, you can just uh, use a, a complex analysis, uh, and perhaps you, you want to regularize the left-hand side to justify the, the computations. So once you have that, you can show that the L infinity norm of this guy here is less than 1 over square root of t, just by uh, scaling, right, multiplication by t, amounts to dividing by uh, 1 over root t on the other side. And uh, this gives the, the result. All you have to do is to interpolate between the two endpoints. Do you guys have, have any questions? You know, please ask if something is not clear or if, I, uh, or if you're missing some of the thing that I take for granted, I'm, I'm happy to provide uh, references. Uh, could, could you just uh, comment on how you interpolate? Because I can see how you're going to get. Uh, I don't see how you're going to get LT prime at the right hand side. That's the. I mean, if you do interpolation in, between these two norms, you're going to get an infinity and uh, uh, L two at the right hand side, not LT prime. So. Uh, so. But, I mean, yeah. If I do it the way I know how to do it. Uh, I, I think. Get the same result. No, I, I think it's the same way as as I do. So you just here you have you have a bound from L2 to L2, right? And the second bound is from L1 to L infinity. Yeah, so, so I don't quite see how we get L prime, L2 prime at the right hand side. That's the, the whole thing. Uh, right, so, so here, uh, if you want, the, the two endpoints are... Then maybe you can just uh, write your interpolation inter inequality that you're using that is the clearest. Okay. Uh, so maybe, uh, yeah, let uh, Ah, yes. So it, it's just the, you know, the classical thing. If I have an operator T that maps LP1, can you see here? Yes, to LQ1, yeah. LP2 to LQ2. Then it is mapping LP to LQ if uh, 1 over P is theta over p1 plus 1 minus theta over q1 and 1 over q is theta over q1 plus 1 uh, sorry this is p2 and here 1 minus theta over q2 C can you read yeah, okay, thanks. So I was thinking about interpolating function, but you're saying you're just you're an interpolation operators. Okay, great, thanks. Right. Uh, okay, yes, and I realize indeed uh, that my, my uh, pen doesn't write so well, so uh, I'll try to adjust. But let me know if it's not so legible. Uh, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I think some people are again not getting in. Ah, okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, so let me erase that.
Okay, so now we're going to discuss uh, strikeout estimates. So this goes back to, you know, work of Bob Strikeout in the, in the 70s. Um, uh, but then it, it became, uh, you know, a very big subject in, in uh, harmonic analysis. Uh, so here is the statement. Uh, maybe before I give the statement, so the idea is if you, if, you ha if, if you choose L2 data, what the dispersive estimates give you is just that uh, the L2 norm is conserved over time. Okay, but we expect more to be true. We expect waves to disperse. Uh, and to see that, you need to choose uh, a certain set of space-time norms, and, and the right set is provided by this theorem. So uh, exponents have to satisfy the following condition, 2 over p plus 1 over q equals 1 half. p lies between 4 and infinity, and q lies between 2 and infinity. Okay. Uh, so then uh, there are three points. The first one is about the uh, linear solution. So let me explain the meaning of this notation. So you look at this, so this linear solution, it's, it's a function of, of space and time. And now you look at it as, as a function in time which is valued in a certain Banach space. Uh, this Banach space is LQ in X. So here X means in the space variable, and here T means in the time variable. So here it's, it's a Lebesgue space in time valued in, in a Banach space, which is also a Lebesgue space in X. And to compute the norm, you take the LQ norm in X, and then you take the LP norm in time. Okay, and the theorem tells you that this is controlled by the norm of f in L2 in space. Uh, and, and so if, since there is this, this global integrability in space and time, of course this means that the waves have to uh, disperse, have to uh, move away to infinity, otherwise there would, there would not be such a such an integrability result. Uh, so that's, that's the first one. And the second one, so that's if you want to solve the linear problem. And then if you want to solve the nonlinear problem, you're going to use a Duhamel type formula. And then you, you need something like what I'm writing now. So that's a Duhamel type term. Uh, so we take it in LP1 and Q1 is less than F in LP2 prime, LQ2 prime, where P1, Q1, P2, Q2 all, all, always satisfy this, this uh, relation here. Okay, so I, I think it's going to be, maybe I should, I should skip the proof because I want to focus more on, on nonlinear applications. Uh, but I, I recommend the, the proof in the book of Tao. It's, it's you know, very, very elegant and, and, and not so complicated, but I just don't have time to, to do it here. So we're going to apply this theorem in a, in a particular case. The question? Yes. Uh, are there inequalities like that for the heat equation as well? Yes, exactly the same is true for the heat equation. Is it also in Chaos 2? Or what, do you know a reference? Uh, well, it's, it's actually simpler for the heat equation. I can show you it why. It should be stronger, I, I would have thought. And it is stronger. Yes. 
So I think it's possible to do it. Uh, well, let me think. So you see, if, if you have a solution of the heat equation, mm -hmm. uh, there are two estimates that you get. One is L infinity in time, L2 in space. And this you estimate by uh, F in L2. But you also gain regularity. You also have something like the gradient E T Laplace and F in L2 in time, L2 in space is less than F in L2. Right? So both you can prove by just an energy estimate. And th the, se the second one is not true for the Schrodinger equation, but it is true for the heat equation. Now, if you use the second one uh, and you use uh, sub-OLF embedding, you're able to recover such results as, as these. But for the strict arts, uh, and it's not surprising because the scaling is the same, right? But for, for, for uh, the Schrodinger equation, uh, you know, you, you, you don't have a gain in regularity. So you, you cannot proceed like that. Does it make sense? Thank you, Ian. Uh, okay, so uh, yes, what we're going to do is to uh, use this uh, result in the specific case where P equals Q equals uh, 6, right? And so you see, for instance, the first assertion becomes an estimate in L6 space-time. Uh, so that, that's the one that we're going to use for the application to the Quintic Schrodinger equation. Okay, if, did, are there any other questions? Okay, so now let me erase that and we're going, we're going to apply this to the Quintic uh, Schrodinger equation. Okay, so uh, the theorem is about scattering for quintic NS. And scattering means uh, that asymptotically the solution behaves linearly. So we consider the following problem, IDTU minus Laplace and U equals u to the 4 times u. So the sign of the nonlinearity is, is irrelevant, as we'll see. And you choose data, u0, uh, which are in L2, and small. That is smaller than some absolute constant. 
then there exists a global solution in L6 space-time, which is the, the strict arts uh, space that we just saw, R times R. So what we saw is that the strict arts space uh, is such that the linear solution would, would belong to it, but now we have an assertion about the, the nonlinear problem. Uh, and furthermore, there exists f in L2 such that u of t minus e i t. Uh, so I should put a plus here. I think that's good. This in L2 goes to zero as t goes to infinity. Right, so, so what might happen is that, you know, uh, for small time, there are some nonlinear interactions going on. But if you wait long enough, all you see is just uh, a linear solution uh, emerging. And this is only due to the decay of waves. The decay is so strong that the uh, nonlinear term will be just absorbed by the uh, linear part of the solution. Okay, so that's, that's the statement that we will prove. And as you'll see, it's, it's really a small exercise once, once you know the strict arts estimates. Uh, maybe I can write this. So the starting point of the proof is to write uh, Duhamel's formula, so which is just uh, uh, essentially filtering by the uh, linear part of the equation and writing the equation in an integral instead of a differential form. So an equivalent formulation is the following. And this is on, on this form of the equation that we will prove estimates. It's more uh, convenient. Okay, so uh, let's let's go for the for the proof. I'm, I'm going to erase. Okay, so let's, let's go for the proof. So, inspired by the Duhamel formula, uh, what we will do is we will show that the map uh, let's call it T, which takes a function V and maps it to uh, the formula we just had except uh, you put v in the nonlinear term. Uh, v to the 4, sorry. So 
So we want to show that this is a contraction on uh, the ball in the Banach space X of center zero radius two epsilon. And here X, as you can imagine, it's L6 in space time and epsilon is the L2 norm of uh, the data. Uh, and actually I should put a, a constant here. So sorry, it's not two, it's a constant C which is uh, sufficiently big. So what does it mean? It means, uh, in other words, we want to show that T maps this ball to itself. And second, TV minus TW in the topology of X, so in L6, L6, is less than one half. So any constant less than one would do the job times V minus W in X, right? And then you can apply Banach's fixed point theorem, which gives you the uh, existence and uniqueness of a fixed point. So uh, Banach's theorem gives you the existence and uniqueness in this ball. Then if you work a bit harder, you're able to get existence and uniqueness in, in the whole space. Uh, okay, well, this is uh, going to be uh, a consequence of the strict arts estimates. Uh, let's just write what TV minus TW is. So TV minus TW, it's the integral between zero and T, E to the I, Uh, so now you get V to the four times V minus W to the four times W DS. And this, uh, you know, it's a classical identity. You can write it as something like V minus W times uh, V to the four plus W to the four. Not exactly that, but something with this flavor, like the difference of V and W, and then, uh, or maybe V bar and W bar, and then uh, quartic terms. Okay, and now all we need to do is to apply uh, the strict arts estimate. So let's go, we want to estimate TV minus TW in the X space, which is just uh, L6 in space time. So we apply a uh, strict arts estimate. So here we apply strict arts. And uh, what we get is that this is uh, what's inside the integral term. So V minus W. times V to the four plus W to the four. This uh, in the dual, which is L six over five space time. And now all there remains to do is to apply Hölder's inequality. So here we, have, we apply Hölder. And we see that this is less than uh, V minus W in L6 space time times V in L6 space time to the four plus W 
in L6 space time to the 4. Okay, and uh, now if uh, V and W belong to the ball, they are less than epsilon. So this is less than epsilon to the 4. So if you choose epsilon sufficiently small, uh, this is less than a half. And then you can also absorb all the implicit constants. And you get uh, that this map is a contraction and you get that there is a fixed point and the fixed point uh, by Duhamel's formula is, a, is the desired solution of, of uh, the quintic uh, NLS. So uh, this, this was proving the contraction part then you need to show that T maps the ball to itself it's, uh, it's not very hard it's the same order of ideas so I will, I will skip that. Uh, oh, sure. do, do you guys have any questions? Yes, maybe, maybe the question is a little too broad. Sure, no problem. The broader, the better. So, uh, we need Stinger's estimates in for L2 data, right? Yes. Are there nonlinearities where we don't necessarily need to use Stinger's? Yeah, yeah, of course. So here, you know, I, I chose the quintic because the numerology works beautifully, right? Uh, but um, if, if the nonlinearity is, is, is strong enough, and if you take data, so, you know, it's an interplay between the, the nonlinearity that has to be sufficiently strong and the data that has to be sufficiently localized uh, that you get some, uh, some decay. Right. Um, so then, uh, yeah, it, it, it's it's really case dependent. Does this answer your question? Yes. So can you comment what would happen with different powers? Say you took a larger power, you think that the right hand source would be then smaller on, on one hand because there's more powers, but on the other, uh, there are places where it's big, it could get worse. Right. So. Exactly right. That's if, if the power is bigger, then uh, you're better off as far as decay. But uh, you know, it, it magnifies uh, singularities. So there is a trade-off, right? So in your in your proof, what would uh, what what would go wrong, or what would uh, uh, what, what what would it work? Which part would? Well, uh, you know. So suppose instead of v to the four, I have v to the ten here, right? Um, you know, if, if I can get a bound for V in L infinity, then, then I'm good, right? But if V is not bounded in L infinity, then there is a problem. If, on the other hand, I can, I can show that can V... Can you get an L infinity bound just for small data uh, for this or not? Well, not for L2 data. Then you would need to have uh, smoother data. I see. And, and then you could just... Uh... And then, well, basically, it's uh, uh, there is no rule, but there, it's a trade-off between these two things. Yeah. And if the power is smaller, what would happen? So that's our next uh, point. Okay. Um, but I wanted to show uh, scattering. Maybe let, let me try to show scattering. So just if you take your power 10 and you take L2 data, it's yeah. known it's wrong or...? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Well, it's, it's what's going to, you know, this sort of, this is like a miracle that everything works neatly, right? But in general, uh, you need to struggle a bit more with indices. In particular, if your power is 10, so in the jargon, it's called L2 supercritical. And it means that you, you're not even locally well posed in L2, right? Uh, then sort of you get a lot of decay, so it's great. But if you have a singularity in the data, it, it, it derails everything. Okay,
Okay, let me just show uh, quickly how to get uh, scattering. Scattering, so which is asymptotically linear behavior. So let's, let's start with the formula. So we have a solution and we know our solution is doing this. U of t is e i t Laplace and u naught plus the integral e i t minus s Laplace u squared u s ds. Okay, and we'd like to write it as e i t Laplace times something. So there is an obvious way of rearranging this expression. We can write it as e i t Laplace applied to u naught plus the integral between zero and infinity e minus i s Laplace u squared d, uh, sorry u to the four u d s minus e to the i t Laplace integral e uh, sorry between t and infinity e minus i s Laplace u to the 4 u ds right so this is our candidate for the f and then uh, this is the remainder um, so we want our uh, so I'm, I'm just going to show that f is in l2 right and using the same idea, you can show that the remainder goes to zero. So why is f in L2? Well, um, maybe I should write here. So we, we know that there is this estimate e i t Laplace and f in L2 less than f in L2. Oh, sorry, here it's L6 space time less than F in L2. So you, 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 can, you can take the dual of this inequality um, and obtain, so the dual is the following, the integral between minus infinity and infinity of E i t Laplace F of t dt in L2 is less than f in L6 over 5. So this is x and this is space time. So how do you do that? Uh, you know, you just say that the left hand side here, uh, so it's this L6 norm, so you, 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 you characterize it by duality and then you move the operator to the uh, dual test function and you get that. So why is f in L2? Well, it suffices to apply this to get that the integral between zero and infinity e minus i s Laplace u for u ds in L2. So if we apply strict arts, we get that this is yes, less than u to the four u in L6 over 5, uh, right, which is less. So this is by strict arts, and then uh, it's actually equal to U in L6 to the 5. So this shows that this is indeed in L2, and using the same ideas, you can show that the remainder goes to 0, uh, which is the, the, the scattering result. Okay, so, uh, however, uh, you know, that the idea with strict arts estimates is that there is never like a specific rate. Everything is given in terms of uh, integrability. So you're not going to be able to say that the remainder goes to zero as t to some power. All we know is that it goes to zero. Okay, so now uh, let me erase that. And, and we'll discuss the cubic equation where interesting things happen uh, and answer the, the question of Piotr. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Yes, yes, you, you can also you can also show yes, this you can also show, that's right, yes. And do you get uniqueness there or only in L6? Uh, so uniqueness just in in the set of continuous functions which are L2 valued? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. But I think it's a, it's difficult. If it's true, it's difficult, I would say. But I'm not sure. Okay. Oh, thinking of your question, if you're just continuous with values in L2, right? How do you make sense of the equation? How do you make sense of the quintic term? Yeah, so you have to know. <laughs> right? So just to, if the weakest you can achieve is that the equation makes sense in the sense of distributions, right? So then you need u to the 5 to make sense in the sense of distributions. I think the weakest you can have is that u to the 5 is in L1, space-time, right? To be meaningful as a distribution. So this would be something like u in L5, space-time. I think you need something like that. Otherwise, you cannot give a meaning to the equation. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so now you can ask if it's only L5, you can give a meaning to the equation, but you're not L6, so you cannot use the what I just said. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if the, it's possible to bridge the gap to get uniqueness. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so yes, so now let's let's discuss the uh, cubic NS. Uh, so the cubic NLS, so uh, this one doesn't work very well. I like this one. Ah, not so nice. Ah, that's nice. Uh, so it's the cubic equation. Cubic NLS. So we look at this problem. And we provide data uh, which are such that X U naught in L2 is small. Uh, then there exists a unique solution. There exists a unique solution. U, uh, which is such that So you have a couple of things. So first, uh, x u of t in L2 grows uh, at a s uh, slow rate, t to the epsilon, where epsilon is small. And ultimately, it depends on the size of the data. 
uh, no, 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 not even for any any epsilon. Um, okay, then you get the linear decay, the optimal linear decay. So this is less. Right, so that's the optimal linear decay, so that's not surprising. What is more surprising is that uh, you don't get scattering, but still you're able to characterize the asymptotic behavior in the following way. So it's easier to look at the, at the Fourier picture. So you take the Fourier transform in, in space. If you did have scattering, then this would behave like e to the minus i t xi squared f hat of xi. Ah, this one is dying off too. Nice. Right, so this, this... Uh, may, yeah. may, may I continue with what you said before? Yes. So, so to make sense of the equation, you would need at least some U3 in some space while, uh, while your initial data are, are only in L2 uh, with a weight maybe. So, uh, so, that, so are you saying that initial data in L2 space imply that uh, the solution will be in U3 uh, state time? That's part of the statement or something like that? Uh, yeah, I think so, right? Actually, by... Uh so, yeah, okay, so mm, I, I think that's enough. Maybe you need a bit more, but sort of the, the linear flow regularizes the solution, right? So I, I think that's enough. I, I, should, I should check, but I, I think that's enough. So if this was, right, so if, if we had scattering, then we would just get that, right? That's uh, what a linear solution looks like. On, on the Fourier side. Interestingly, there is no, there is an additional term here, which is a logarithmic uh, correction. So here you get e to the i log t times f hat of c squared. Right, so there is an, a logarithmic correction to scattering. So it means that the Nonlinearity cannot just sort of plainly be absorbed in the linear term, uh, but uh, on the contrary, it, it has a, a, a long time, large range effect uh, on, on the asymptotic behavior of the solution. It's Are we in any dimension here, or this is one plus one? Or? Everything is dimension one. At the, for the whole uh, lectures, everything is dimension one. Yes, um, and it's and uh, indeed this relies on the fact that that uh, things are one D. Why is that? Um, so it's possible to see that that the cubic NLS cubic NLS is is yeah. Is your F supposed to be U dot or um, uh, F? So f is just uh, some function. So I should be, I should say uh -huh. there exists an f such that this, okay. and this is as t goes to infinity. Right. So uh, why could we have expected such a correction? So cubic analysis is, is is critical in some sense in dimension y one. Sorry. Uh, why is that? It's because the nonlinearity barely fails to be integrable in L2. So uh, let's look at uh, u squared u in L2. And uh, so in the best possible case, u is bounded in L2 and decays like one over root t in L infinity, like a um, linear solution would do. So in this case, this would be like 1 over t, which is not integrable, and actually whose integral gives a log. So uh, this is you know, one explanation why you get this, this log here. Uh, so it means you cannot 
even if things decay as much as you can hope for, you cannot simply absorb the nonlinear term uh, in, the, in the linear term. And um, I should say this, uh, so the, the quintic equation is a bit of a, an academic problem, but the cubic equation is, I think, really relevant uh, physically. And actually, uh, if you look at any equation in 1D, uh, one way or another, uh, it's going to have a, an interaction that looks like that in it, and there is going to be a log correction uh, for the large time behavior. That is, uh, if you think of uh, KDV or, uh, you know, I mean, you, you pick your favorite 1D equation, um, uh, Klein Gordon, uh, uh, Benjamin Ono, so <laughs> any 1D equation whose uh, nonlinearity is not of an artificially high power will contain this, this correction. So it's, it's, it's really a generic phenomenon, uh, which it's important to, to understand. Uh, okay, so this, I think this goes back to uh, Ozawa. Uh, then there is a paper by uh, Hayashi and Naumkin. And the approach that I'm going to explain is due to Cato and Pusateri. Um, yes, so I don't have much time. I'm just going to explain to you how one can uh, find the correction, but I won't prove any estimates. And I, I think I'm running out of this thing. Yes, let me get uh, some more. I'll be right back. Ouch. So don't move. I'll be right back. Do you have any questions while I erase? Uh, yes, yeah, so the question from Piotr was about the regularity of the solution or about the, how we pose the, the question or, uh, because it wasn't being made. Because here we can, the, the, the equation that you wrote, so in the differential sense, but we can only pose it in the integral sense, right? It will be to uh, mm, mm, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. Why? So, because the result that I know about this from, I think it's from the book by Ponce, that states that if you have uh, two initial data, then you, your solution will uh, be continuous into R2. Mm -hmm. And for that, we can not like write down but I'm sure in the book by Ponce, they don't only prove that. They also prove stronger estimates that uh, allow you to make sense of the equation. So you can make sense of the equation through uh, Duhamel's formula, or uh, just as a weak solution in the sense of distributions. But either way, I think you need some space-time integrability to make sense of it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, maybe you're right. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I could not hear you. Sorry, my um, Were you saying that the point that you made in the equation, 
So, uh, I, I think there are no derivatives involved here. It's just the non. So the, the linear term, uh, to make sense of it, you can just do it in the sense of distributions, and all you need for a linear expression to make sense in the sense of distributions is that u is itself a distribution. So it doesn't get any weaker. Now, if you, if you look at the nonlinear term, you want u to the 5 or u to the 3 to make sense in the sense of distributions. Okay? And I think the, only, the, you know, the best you can do is to say that this is a, an integrable function. This is in L1, right? And u to the 5 is in L1 if and only if u is in L5. I, I don't think you can do any, any better. And how you get u to be in L5, uh, this has to be assumed, right? Otherwise, the equation doesn't make sense. Does this answer your question? Yes, yeah, so, so are you saying that um, in this case, you, you would not have, mm -hmm. it will be in L5? Oh, sorry, you, you got cut. So you're saying that in Uh, so, I mean, unfortunately, I, I won't have time to s specify exactly in which space the solution lives, but it has to be in a space such that the equation makes sense. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, all I want to do now is to is to explain how you find the correction. So, how to find the correction? How to find the correction? So the idea is to, we start from Duhamel's formula. Uh, do we want Duhamel's formula? No, not even. Um, all right, let's do Duhamel's formula. So u of t and x is e i t Laplace and u naught plus the integral between 0 and t, e i t minus s Laplace and uh, u squared u. Okay, and now we want to reduce to a stationary phase estimate. So uh, first thing, we take the Fourier transform. Okay, and as you know, the Fourier transform turns products into convolution. So if you have three functions, it's going to be the uh, convolution of uh, three functions. And there is one that carries a bar. Uh, so let me get the formula right. Okay, so it's just taking the Fourier transform and, and making use of the fact that a product becomes a convolution. Uh, okay, so we want to apply the stationary phase lemma, uh, but at this point, you know, u is still oscillating pretty hard in the time variable, right? There is a lot of oscillation that's coming from this guy here. So we're going to remove it uh, by letting f to be e to the i t Laplacian, uh, let me get the sign right, minus it Laplacian, u. So in other words, we uh, filter by, by the Schrodinger uh, group. So if you do the computation, what comes out is, so it's just multiplying all each single u by e to the i t c squared, right? So what comes out is f hat of t c equals u naught hat of xi plus the integral between 0 and t. And here, okay, so that's the important piece. So the phase is um, i t, oh, sorry, i s, it's an s, xi squared 
minus xi minus eta minus sigma squared plus eta squared minus sigma squared f hat of eta f hat of sigma d eta d sigma and now it it looks like once again a stationary phase problem there's a net missing probably at the right hand side because there should be three. Oh yes yeah it's, it's, thank you thanks but a lot also there's an integral in s that's right thank you the s and then there is two integrals here and then here there is f hat of xi minus eta minus sigma. Here it's f hat of minus eta bar. Okay, so like that it's correct. So uh, we use the stationary phase lemma. So let, let me recall it and provide a higher dimensional version. Uh, I should find one that works. So, uh, okay, so now we're in dimension D, but there is still an oscillatory integral. So in dimension D, this is one over lambda to the D over two times E to the I lambda phi of X naught f of x naught and sorry uh, I forgot to term 1 divided by the determinant of the Hessian of phi of x naught and x naught is a critical point it's say the unique critical point of phi Right, so that's the d-dimensional uh, stationary phase lemma. And that's exactly what we need here. Right, this is just a stationary phase. So if we freeze the time variable, this is really just uh, a uh, an oscillatory integral. And so we can compute the uh, equivalent using the stationary phase lemma. So this is the phase, this uh, quadratic expression. And so, you know, you compute what the critical points of this phase are with respect to eta and sigma, and then you compute the Hessian, and then you apply this formula, and what comes out, yes? So when, you, when you're using the stationary phase lemma, what does it mean equivalent here exactly? So there's an error term probably? Ah, yes. So, so how much do understand the equivalent? Yes, yes. So this is this. It's equal, there is a constant, a multiplicative constant, and then uh, the next term I think is uh, lambda to the minus d plus 1 over 2. So then you have to, to worry about absorbing all this in the, the, the error in your calculation somehow, right? Yes, but you that's, see, that's not an issue. What, what's going to happen, so now we apply the stationary phase lemma to this guy here. Right, and what comes out? It is exactly one over s times f hat of c squared f hat of c. So it's once again this lack of integrability that results in the logarithmic correction. The next term is integrable, so it's going to be good. And uh, if now you go back to the differential version of the equation there is an i missing here, there should be an i. So the differential version of the equation is uh, dt f hat of t x e is 1 over s f hat of t x e squared f hat of t x e plus integrable terms that we don't care about. And now it's easy to integrate this, right? Uh, it should be t. Right, this is just, uh, th there is an i, sorry. It's just x dot equals i over t 
x squared x. So we know how to integrate this ODE over complex numbers, and this gives the uh, logarithmic correction that I was uh, claiming. So once you understand that, actually, in order to prove the global existence uh, and the decay, you need to uh, you need to uh, find the, the right correction. This gives the right correction to scattering. And if you put that in the machine and you work a bit, uh, you get the, the theorem. And uh, I have to stop here, but I thank you. I thank you very much for your attention. And maybe you have further questions. I'd like to have another question for this uh, equivalence in the uh, stationary point lemma uh, because, of course, when you have the order, uh, it, it should be uh, uh, well, it depends upon some norm of not right. If you present a very an estimate in terms of the norm of f, that's true. Error. That's true. So what, yeah. what, what is the norm which enters in this uh, in the estimate of the error? That, that's a very good point. So, this, uh, this here holds for phi and f smooth. For, for phi and f smooth, you have an expansion, and the next term is uh, this much smaller. Now, in what we do, we don't have f smooth, right? The type of estimate we can propagate is something like f hat in h1. So the Fourier transform here, uh, which corresponds to the non-Fourier transform f here, is in h1. So we need a, a version of the stationary phase lemma for f in h1. And then, you know, you need to work, you get something a bit less good here, but still integrable, and, and you can close the estimates. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, do you have a heuristic explanation as to why for the given case you need a work in the phase? Yes, yes. So, so that's uh, w what I was trying to say. Let me say it here. Um, the, if you look at the nonlinear term, u squared u, in L2, right? The best you can hope for is that u behaves like a linear solution. So then in L infinity, so let's, let's bound this by u in L infinity squared times u in L2. And so if u was linear, this is 1 over t, this is 1, so this whole thing is like 1 over t, right? So the, the nonlinear term fails to be integrable in L2, uh, you know, barely fails to be integrable in L2. That's the reason. I, th there could be sort of a, here this is only taking into account decay. The next step is to look at resonances. And this is exactly what this computation is doing. This computation is, is blending together decay and resonances and, and giving this result. Other questions? Uh, okay, well, uh, if not, thanks again, and uh, I will see you next week, same time. Bye bye. Uh, Pierre, si je peux oh. me permettre un commentaire. Bien sûr, bien sûr. Uh, je, un commentaire formel. Uh, si tu avais une chemise unique sombre, on aurait mieux. Tu peux le cadrer, euh, interfère avec. D'accord. Ah, mais noir, ce serait parfait. Oui, mais enfin, n'importe quoi, uni ou euh, sombre, ou un pull. Ou... Ok, ok, merci. Le, le, le uh, ok, merci. Ciao.